absolutely so wonderful to be able to take the time and focus in on the health care issues. And I know Dolores and Lee will be coming in. Um, so this year, you're going to have the federal, state, and local perspective. And it's wonderful. And that's how health care is accessed and paid for. You've got participation at each level. You all know Johnny Blakely, who is out on the field rep, and he is uh, someone who is out here a lot. And I know you all see him a lot more than you see me because he's on the ground and in the neighborhood all the time. I'm so glad that Marvin is here in Quinto Mental Health is here. They were in D.C. when I received the uh, Mental Health Services Award, Congressional Award, and it was done because of the work that I've done with our troops at Fort Campbell in addressing the PTSD issues that our troops have. And they've also been very supportive of the work that I've done, and I appreciate this, uh, allowing, it's, it was a 10-year a, a push to open up the care for veterans, and it, we just got it through in, in our uh, veterans reform bill, allowed them to get health care in their local communities, and to get some parity for the mental health as well as the other medical services. And so we just think it's wonderful that you now local providers will be paid by the VA for rendering those services rather than our vets having to travel long distances to seek those services. So um, we appreciate it having, having that help. A uh, quick update on the, um, I guess the advent and the implementation and uh, what we have now is the execution of Obamacare <laughs> and all things Obamacare. Uh, we are up to about 27,000 pages of rules. Uh, we hear from our hospitals and our providers on a regular basis that Friday afternoons about 4 o'clock they have new rules effective immediately hitting the inbox. Uh, we know that this is difficult uh, to deal with. We have a small provider in our district, about a 100 bed hospital, and uh, the same person does IT and compliance. And uh, she said that she works, ends up working most weekends in order to uh, make the changes and the things that, that are necessary. And when you've got a small hospital, uh, that's pretty much what you have to do. But we are continuing, you know, we passed a lot of bills in the House that would make this easier for you. Would lessen the paperwork, would rescind some of the rules, repeal portions, of the bill make this a little bit more workable. And these, and even though we've passed 347 bills in total out of the House, 98% of which have been done with a bipartisan vote, these bills are all sitting on Harry Reid's desk. And they're waiting, waiting for uh, to be taken up by Harry Reid. You know, it's, it's amazing, as I said, 98% of the bills have a uh, bipartisan vote. Uh, 200 of them were unanimous votes. 100 of the 347 had a two-thirds majority or greater. 100 of them. And of the balance, everything, 98%, a bipartisan vote, and we can't get free to take them up. A lot of the things that you all are concerned about uh, less patient time, readmissions, uh, different uh, putting, repealing certain sections of Obamacare, like my legislation that we do, the across state line purchase of health insurance, open up the health insurance marketplace, get the breakdown uh, for employers and individuals. Um, that is something that is still sitting on the desk and is waiting. Harry Reid to take it up. So once we get past November, and the expectation is that Republicans are going to take the Senate, uh, they need six seats, um, could get 10. There are 10 seats in play, but I think it's fairly confident that they're going to get the six. Then we'll be able to move some of these through the Senate and send them to the president's desk. Um, many of these provisions are 
popular enough that, you know, things like rescinding the three-day admission rule, things of that nature. You get out. Okay. All of this should easily move on through. This is the kind of relief that you all need. Um, another thing that's important to home health delivery, because you use iPhones and apps to hold uh, data that helps with diagnostics, my legislation, the bill I wrote, a lot of it came out of consultation with home health care providers, the Software Act, which keeps the FDA from regulating those mobile medical apps, of which we now have 97,000 in the marketplace, 15% of which are used by providers. That should quickly move through. So uh, we look forward to having um, those changes. We continue to work closely with our hospitals, uh, with our FQHCs on the way they're interfacing, uh, the way they are, that they're working. We continue to work closely with our, our mental health providers, especially when it comes to dealing with the PTSD and the needs of our troops that are coming in. Uh, we continue to work through the issues of home health providing. Uh, you all know when I was in the State Senate, I put that uh, pilot project in place, we've talked about this before, that allowed um, the state program, the 10 care programs with the dual eligibles to go in and provide home health care services. Home health care in Tennessee has been very successful. <coughs> That's because you all and groups and companies like yours across the state do a good job of delivering accountable care, uh, predictable care, and allowing uh, people and seniors to be in a, an environment that they're comfortable with and a place where they want to be and uh, where they feel uh, more secure. So we're going to continue to work through those issues. Let me just open up the floor and Don, I'll take questions. And we've got the mayors, we've got Dolores and Lisa <coughs> are coming in and we'll just take questions as we as we work through it. So. <coughs> All right, and, and of course, you know, none of us are here for our health, okay? We're, yes, we enjoy what we do, but at the end of the day, we want to receive reimbursement for the services that we, that we provide. Uh, we know that there are some additional cuts coming in 2015. Uh, the CMS has already rolled those out, what we can anticipate. Um, how, much, how, much, how many more cuts do you receive? Well, and you see, this is uh, one of the reasons we want to be able to have a budget passed because um, the Senate will not take a budget up. You know, we'll have another continuing resolution. We've done this every year since 2009. We're dealing with the only administration and president ever not to pass, sign, seal, deliver a budget. So, um, because of the way Obamacare is written, they took $500 billion out of Medicare over, this is a 10-year number, to stand up Obamacare. So they're channeling that money. Now, this is one of the reasons we have taken the administration to court on the Obamacare issue. Because there are things that um, you can't do part of the law and not all the law things of that nature. So what they're trying to do is hit that delta every year and make those numbers work. And to say, it's going to be this much this year, this much next year, it's kind of a rolling number. And it does put the squeeze down on reimbursements. Now, we know what their goal is because you've had Pelosi and Reed and Waxman say it. They want a single payer system where everything, every healthcare deliverer provider is a federal employee or a federal federally contracted entity. And <clears throat> they want that Medicare and Medicaid rate to be the same, which is the lower number. We know that. Uh, they've been pretty transparent about that. And our goal is going to be, um, and hopefully when we uh, do our tax extenders to deal with SGR, deal with some of the reimbursement issues and get them on a longer window than 12 months so that you all know what to expect. You know, we've talked to a lot of our health care providers and we hear it from our military too. They'd love
club horse could do a two-year budget so that they've got enough predictability to step up and provide service and know, what, know what's going to be coming back in. Yeah. Anybody else? Questions? Ask about anything? I'll ask another one. <laughs> okay. Well, they'll think of something. They'll, and yeah. we have a late guest come in. We've got about a round table introduction. I know that you're with Cornerstone. Yes, I'm Cindy Walensky, and I'm the president and owner of Cornerstone. It's good to have you with us this morning. Thank you. I apologize for doing that. It's quite okay. Um, I think last year when you were here, we talked about the Medicare Advantage plans. Yeah. Okay. And that's still a hot button with, with mm -hmm. so many of us. Uh, nursing homes, do you all want to chime in on that? Yeah. Bit? Give me some. Y'all had great feedback on all that question. Uh, I mean, we know just the, just the reimbursement rates are just just terrible with many of those, and then how how they're perceived by the population, much of the population who, who is involved in the advantage plans. Advantage, you know, it makes it sounds like it's you know bigger and better when in fact it's not. Uh, it's the elderly are damaging. still suffering. So, Glenda, I'll let you chime in on this. Or basically, or basically, they're still the elderly are suffering because they take these advantage plans and then they come into the facilities with hopefully to get skill care, and it's only short term, seven to fourteen days, and then they have to go back home. And <laughs> and many times they go back home and they die, and that's really sad to see that happening in this community. And I don't think they understand, the elderly understand about the copay on those Medicare Advantage plans. They're huge out-of-pocket copays that they don't, they're not aware of until right. they need the service. And it's like, we can't afford that service yeah. now. You know, we hear this not only from the copay, the, that new <coughs> schedule yeah. right. that mm -hmm. is on Medicare Advantage plans, but well, we hear it on the Obamacare insurance mm -hmm. also. When we were at breakfast this morning, I was telling them about a uh, lady that had written in on the email to me, and she had said, you know, she said her company terminated insurance and everybody had to go to the exchange, find their own insurance. So she goes to the exchange, and they said, well, for, I think it was the middle tier plan, she could get a subsidy. She's a single mom for children. So... She did that, and then the premiums were still more than what her premium had been at work. Mm -hmm. Her employer provided the insurance, and she thought, okay, we, we can deal with this. Then she found out her deductible was $6,000. And, you know, it's that out of pocket, mm -hmm. and the way that you don't have what people had anticipated would be a copay that helps you manage it and to front load all of this. And her point was, you know, she said, I don't have $6,000 to handle this, so how are you all going to fix this? Mm -hmm. And the way you do it is to get rid of this government-managed insurance. We've already heard from Blue Cross Blue Shield. They expect their plans to go up 18 to 20% this year. Mm -hmm. And when you are looking at that kind of escalation rate and just the cost of insurance, which gets you in the queue, then what ends up happening is you don't have access to the care because the insurance is so expensive and the benefits are less. Mm -hmm. And the MA enrollees are definitely seeing this because that's where they're going and cutting first to cut money out of that care to stand up Obamacare. Now what happens is our hospitals, you're with the hospital, right? You're with the hospital. They are seeing people who can't afford the out-of-pocket and can't afford to pay for that or they're being moved out of the facility earlier. Then they end up at the emergency room because they say, well, they're going to have to take us. So how much is your emergency room going to go? Your, uh, uh, how many? Uh, they're probably at about 15%, 10 to 15%. But the big 